I'm sure there's a number of you who might be sitting there and you're seeing and just wondering, what the heck is the Reformation? Okay, that's all right. The Reformation is something that happened in history in the early 1500s. You might have read about it in, in high school or in a college class. Uh, it's something that led up to the time when people sought religious freedom here in the U.S. Now, there's a lot of things that really fueled the Reformation, a lot of different ways that you can look at it. You can look at it as, as a political thing that happened where there was this big change in the church and state relationship in history. You can look at it as, as an economical thing that happened where the, the poor revolted against the rich or the people in power. You can look at it morally as a time when there was a great spiritual awakening that happened in people in a time of a lot of hypocrisy and lasciviousness. Or you can look at it intellectually as a time when Christians once again began to, to think for themselves, having access to the Bible for the first time in hundreds of years. There's a, there's a ton of factors that really sparked and, and spawned the radical change uh, that was brought about by the Reformation in, in history. A lot of things were kind of brewing at the time, kind of like if you think of a, like a campfire. There was a, there was a lot of uh, wood and, and kindling, and it was all set there. And a young pastor named Martin Luther was, was the spark, the, the, the match that lit the fire that engulfed the entire world. Now, just to be clear, today when we talk about Martin Luther, we're talking about a different Martin Luther than Martin Luther King Jr. of the American Civil Rights Movement. Martin Luther of the Reformation, he was a, a, a monk who, who wore a hooded robe and had a funny haircut. So that's the Martin Luther we're talking about today. Here's a period painting of, uh, that somebody did of him, so uh, interesting guy. Uh, here's a condensed version of his story. He was 22 when he entered the monastery um, to, to study the Bible and to become a monk. He was he was greatly concerned for his salvation. He had a very troubled conscience, as he would describe it. He spent a long time in, in Catholic confession booths trying to confess everything he could think of, and then he would walk out of the booth and take 10 steps away and say, oh, I forgot something else. I need to go confess to the priest. Again, very troubled conscience. So to try and help him, his, his advisor suggested that he became a pastor, uh, that he become a pastor. And so that was seven years after he'd entered the monastery, so he would have been about, about 29 years old at the time. Since he was a pastor, he started doing what good pastors are supposed to do and started preaching through books of the Bible like we do here. And in 1515, he started preaching through the book of Romans, but he didn't get very far because when he came to verse 17 of the very first chapter of Romans, it wrecked him. He wrestled with it for weeks, this verse, Romans 1. 17, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just to live by faith. What, what Luther had been taught is that phrase, the righteousness of God revealed, meant the, the, the judgment or the, the punishment of God revealed upon sinners who don't have or exercise enough faith. And this wrecked Luther. Luther had been, been trying for for years and years, over and over again, trying to do everything right so that God would accept and, and approve of him, but he could never get there. He says when he, when he read this verse, it just struck his conscience like, like lightning. He knew that he was a, an unrighteous sinner who fell far short of, of God's demand. So this verse, just like a hammer, just was beating him up over and over again. Luther was was really wrestling with God like we all at, at times must do to really wrestle with God. And when Luther got really honest with himself, he, he realized that he was horrified at what he found inside. That he, he says he realized he hated God and he did not love him at all. But rather than, rather than bailing on God because of this difficult time in his life, like many do when they face difficult things, he kept digging, digging into the Bible Further and digging into this verse. And he began to focus on the second half of the verse, reading the context carefully. The second half, it says, the just shall live by faith. And, and what Luther began to see is that the righteousness of God that is revealed is one that is provided by God as, as a gift. 
So the revealed isn't a a judgment of God coming down upon sinners, but a provision of God for sinners. That it's revealed or given in in Jesus. That it's it's a righteousness of Jesus that is given to sinners through faith in Him. They live not through their own righteous acts, their own righteousness, but through Jesus' righteousness. When Luther realized this, he said it was as though he saw the sun for the first time. It became the point that he looked at in his life from that point forward that he became a Christian. He says this about that moment. He says, I was altogether born again and had entered paradise itself through open gates. Isn't that interesting? For about seven years of the time, a guy's already a monk and a pastor becomes a Christian through reading the Bible. You might be here today, and maybe you grew up in a Christian home, or you've come to church, or you've called yourself a Christian, but you haven't actually truly believed in, in Jesus for your salvation. You've been trusting in your own efforts and trusting in trying to be a good person for God's acceptance or approval. For Luther, reading this verse and coming to understand the good news, the gospel of Jesus for the first time, Time. It radically changed everything. He started writing all kinds of stuff about it, wrote books and, and documents about his discovery of justification by faith. Romans, he started publicly questioning the abuses of the church, which had really hidden and skewed the gospel, changing it in many ways to salvation or justification by works, type of religion of works, priests and pastors. They were literally selling salvation for money and what they called indulgences. So you could, you could literally buy supposed pieces of Jesus' cross and that, if you did that, it'd gain you a quicker passage in to heaven. Preachers, the priests, they were preaching the fires of, of hell and telling people really that they could be saved as, if the price was right. <laughs> Confession booths and attending church, it was big financial business. So one day, Martin Luther, he wrote what would be kind of the modern day equivalent of a blog that he posted. There was no internet, so instead of posting it online, he posted it on the door of the Wittenberg Castle. And basically what happened was that this post went viral. Okay, Uh, It was October 31st, 1517, the day that many of you think of as Halloween is actually Reformation Day. Uh, October 31st, he posted the document titled The 95 Theses. In two days, it'll be 500 years since he did that event that historians now point to as as the moment that started this massive movement in history we call the Reformation. Now, many people, they started coming to hear Luther preach. They were reading his writings. They'd spread uh, across several countries. They'd reached the, the Pope. The Pope sent some guys to try to to calm Luther down, they, they had uh, a meeting, and, and, and then Luther said, you know, you guys and the Pope are, are wrong to set yourselves up in, as a higher authority than the Bible itself. When the Pope heard that, it got back to him in Rome, he issued what's called the Exerge Domine, the Papal Bull. It was an order for all of Luther's books to be banned and burned in every town, everywhere, and he declared Luther excommunicated, no longer a Christian and no longer part of the church. When Luther was, was handed the bull from the Pope in a great moment of triumph, he took it and he threw it in the fire and he said, well, then I excommunicate the Pope. So Luther was, he was pretty awesome. He was kind of, I don't know, is it okay to say badass? I don't know. Um, probably not. I repent. But uh, he was, he was putting punk rock, you know, Luther. I like him. And what happened then is it led to an even dire, more dire situation. The princes and the rulers, they were responsible, the, the mix of church and state, they were responsible to exercise the, the Pope's decisions and his rule and his authority. So they called this town meeting uh, called the Diet of Worms. That's what it's called now. Uh, Emperor, the, the lords of Spain, Germany, and France were all there present and and they called Luther to be present, and he was there and called to recant what he wrote or faith, burning at the stake to be killed. Uh, Luther feared for his life, and so he said goodbye, his goodbyes to his family and friends, and he went to 
the meeting. He wanted real reform in Jesus' church. He never really set out to, to break off from the Catholic church to start this, this reformation. He went to the meeting hoping to, to talk about what he had written and what he found in, in Scripture. But when he came to the meeting, he wasn't allowed to speak about any of it. They wanted a simple yes or no answer, whether he would recant or not. So when that became clear, Luther, he asked for a brief recess and stepped out of the room deciding what to do. He came back in, stepped in the room, and he, he said these now famous words. Unless I am convinced by Scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of popes and councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is held captive to the Word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything, for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. God help me. Amen. After that, his, his friends rushed him out of there as fast as they could before they could snatch him away to burn him at the stake. And, and that was the spark that started this reformation all across the land. Churches everywhere began to, began to change. And there were new preachers and churches that, that popped up, new leaders. All kinds of things began to happen. Men like John Calvin and John Knox and Oleg Zwingli and Philip Melanchthon and Martin Booster and Thomas Cramner and so many others, William Tyndale and John Wycliffe, as Bibles began being published everywhere and people were reading it for the first time and discovering who Jesus was. It was a great period in our history. People everywhere began to have this revitalized interest and faith in, in Jesus. There was cleansing of souls and hope and peace found and the church began to spring to life once again. This is our heritage. <laughs> this is the Reformation. Now, I'm not here today to bag on, on the Catholic Church. And to be fair, a lot's changed since Vatican II in 1965. The, bo the Bible commands us to honor our father and mother, our physical fathers and mothers. In the same way, I think we, we honor our spiritual tradition of the Catholic Church as our family heritage as well. The historic Christian faith was preserved and passed down through the Catholic Church for 1,500 years. Yet under its guardianship, there came this point, the 1,500s, where the gospel was diminished and nearly lost until this great reformation. Today, in, in many ways, I fear that for both Catholic and Protestant churches alike, we're in danger of losing the gospel once again. The tenets of the Reformation, they are more relevant than ever because of things like a false trust in ourselves and what we can, what we can accomplish and what, what the power of our own wills can do instead of believing that only things, only things that can, good that can happen comes from God's initiative and His grace alone. The danger of an overemphasis on on politics, our own solutions, or attempts to, to fix things. This, once again, this mixing of church and state rather than trusting in faith in Jesus alone. Faith. The minimizing of Christianity is simply being a good moral person. Or we trust our own feelings and experiences instead of having a love, honor, respect for God's Word. having an inflated view of men and women and what we can be and what we can do instead of having a high view of God, that everything is from Him and to Him and for His glory alone. These things are more relevant than ever. The Reformation recovered and prized and preached and rejoiced in. These things are damaging and dangerous to crush people and lead them astray, never addressing issues of the heart 